All right. Let's roll. Welcome to Business Breakthrough Show with Ted Miller III, where every single episode is hosted live to help you uncover a breakthrough to the single greatest challenge you have in getting your business to where you really, really want it to be. So call in, comment, or share. Now, here's your host, Ted Miller III. Rod, you pointed out I'm dressed appropriately for the winter economic season. I'm sporting the thickest sweater I could find to set the tone. There was a couple of emails that went out that were citing the um, data. It showed that 69% of Americans believe that we're going to be in a recession by the end of 2023. Well, I've got, what, 100,000 uh, layoffs that had occurred recently. I've cited tons of that data in the past, so I'm not going to regurgitate any more of that right now. But what I am going to do, what I, I think is going to be really interesting, is let's look back because the past doesn't always dictate the future, but boy, it sure can leave a road to success. And 9% of the people succeeded. Specifically, here's some data. I'm, I'm citing Harvard Business Review. If you guys want to email me, Ted Miller at tedmiller3.com, I'll give you access to this so you can check it out for yourself. And it said, first of all, 17% did not survive. Rod, that's not a surprise to you, is it? Doesn't shock that, me for a minute. Not, not even close. Frankly, the 17% that did not survive, that is of these larger companies they focused on. I think if we got really honest and we looked at the uh, catastrophic failure rate for small business owners, it'd be much higher. But I'm citing their data. So they said of those that they evaluated, which were sizable, recognizable company, 17% did not survive. 80% did not reclaim their pre-recession growth rates on sales or and profits after three years. 40% did not return to their pre-recession actual sales or profits years later. And 9% flourished after a slowdown outperforming rivals by at least 10% in sales and growth profits. So what's the factors that made the factors? Like what's the difference that made the difference? So we talked about it flippantly on one of our previous episodes. We were kind of like spitballing some things. So I'm going to break it down and just map out these um, indicators. They put them into quadrants and said, here's how people responded. And um, they called one, what they call it, preventative focused. 21% uh, were preventative focused. This is where they're like sweating the competition when times get tough and uh, they're looking to avoid losses, minimize uh, downside risk. I, I just call that being reactive. And in this case, in hindsight, we get to say the word too reactive. Uh, basically, companies were saying, let's do more of the same, but with less. Right? That was the mindset. Let's do more of the same, but with less. Not no real improvement efficiencies, just do more of the same, but with less people, that kind of stuff. That's that's the what they call preventative crowd. Uh, they did not succeed. The uh, they were least likely to succeed. I'm going in order from least likely to succeed to the most likely. So I'm starting at the bottom here. The second is the promotional focused crowd. That's what they called it. Um, which they invested more in like offensive moves. Um you know, provide upside benefits uh, more than maybe their peers do. They're, what what happened in this group from the research when you read it, they basically said they got too aggressive towards change. And what that did is they put too much pressure of change on its leadership, which means what? Spread a mile wide, you go an inch deep kind of thing. Just spread too thin, right? You get that. If, if you try to jam too much change on your organization, you're, you're going to have that problem. So they outperformed the other group. Um, only 21% of the survivals list came from the preventative 26% or something from promotional. But the uh, pragmatic, another small incremental improvement, that's kind of where they're trying to balance a little bit of offense and defense. But those that had a tendency to succeed the most, they called them the progressive. They found an optimal, optimal combination of all the things we mentioned previously. 
So I'm going to lay out some of these things and I've got a couple examples, not necessarily case studies. They did the case study. I'm just citing it to shorten it, to make it simple and sweet. So progressive, they're improving operational efficiency is at the top of that list. Operational efficiency in the midst of face of adversity. That sounds like logic. Yet, I would venture to say most race to drop the number of employees before they do to lean in on operational efficiency. Wouldn't that go back to the too reactive crowd? Right? I think most would probably say, okay, what can I do to drop my expense? They could try to drop employees. Whereas what they did that succeeded is they improved operational efficiency first. Now, they did reduce the number of employees. Um, but only 23% of those that succeeded, they had that, the, the, of the 9%, call them inner circle, call them this, those that succeeded, those that grew in the face of diversity, only 23% of them actually cut employees. Whereas the rest, the 56% that floundered, um, they were cutting employees left and right. Uh, an example, Office Depot cut by 6%. And you know what? Office Depot did not do bad through the most recent recession. They had a 50% growth. Now, it's competitor staples. What they did was something different. They looked at operational efficiency and said, let's close down underperforming facilities. But they actually grew their headcount by 10%. So Rod, their competitor, who did well at 50%, I'm talking about Office Depot, did well, 50% growth. During that time, they had twice that. They had a hundred percent rate of growth, and they did not cut. They actually expanded. Now they did close down underperforming stores, but that's classic operational efficiency. I thought that was really cut and dry, easy example. I think all of us can comprehend what in hell Office Depot and Staples do, and you get that general philosophy. But boy, that's outperforming your direct competitor two to one on growth, that's pretty impressive. So uh, investing in new assets, that's something to discuss, which is, let's say, focusing on um, clients, what they, focusing on what your client needs when they look at making investment decisions. So when you're saying, okay, where do I invest my money? Uh, definitely we're going to our clients first. Now that makes sense, but that sets uh, a case study up for the Walmart and the Target. And I'm going to talk about how Target came out as a big winner. Uh, and Nathan, you could definitely join uh, the panelists if you want. We're going deep on this data we discussed previously. Um, so what happened is Target partnered with, uh, here's what Target did that was really brilliant. Uh, because Nate, you mentioned like four or five of these strategies. I'm just covering that data. I think I sent you to hyperlink. Your assistant was asking for the HUD or the HD article. I didn't know what it was until she asked specifically or you did. So thanks. So Target partnered with Amazon to move into online because that was so instead of just blindly going into a new place, I mean, it radical change to their, to their uh, business model. They went and said, let's go partner with the best in the space to do so. Now, they also did invest in expansional locations, specifically, uh, I have notes here, 947 stores to 1,107 stores. So that's that's pretty significant there. I mean, that's a all, darn near 20% increase in number of stores. But they also then teamed up with people that were better at things they weren't doing, which is they wanted to, they were known for being cheap and chic. They went and found designers that were really good at that. Uh, and I don't know their names, Todd Ullman or Michael Grave or Philippe uh, Stark. They they went and partnered uh, with these, uh, teamed up with these designers and uh, brought that to the market. Again, looking at how do we uh, give our clients what they desperately want in the face of adversity. But going back to operational efficiencies, they had other stores in their brands. Uh, excuse my ignorance, I never heard of Hudson or Dayton's, but these were just companies stores that were that they own but they also own marshall fields now have any of you guys ever heard of dayton yes okay you had so maybe it's where rod was at uh nate you ever hear of hudson mm, mm -mm. i don't think so but do, have you ever heard of marshall fields yeah so that's what they did they said more people know of marshall fields 
they doubled down, took Dayton and Hudson and threw them up underneath the Marshall Fields brand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm ranting on what Target did and breaking down all these elements that were distinctions between being preventative, promotional, and being pragmatic. Because yeah. what ended up happening, oh, another thing I, I had said, focus on your clients as a way for uh, bringing strategic innovation into the face of diversity is yeah. how to make sure you're client focused. They changed the focus of our clients from what they want only to what they want and need. Mm. So the want is the cheap chic. So they partnered with those designers. But what they yep. need was the food. I don't know if you guys have ever gone into a Target, but during those periods of time, they really expanded their square footage that was dedicated to offering fundamental needs, not wants, yep. just needs, food. food. Just so you know what it's up to today, that's a $1.8 billion for Target. Wow. Food, $1.8 billion for Target. So their competitors, TJ Maxx, Marshalls, they expanded additional stores. Right. They said, OK, let's go try to compete. Seeing Target grow from 947 stores to 1,107 stores. They said, we're going to add 300 additional stores. Mm -hmm. That was more than what Target did. Um, so we're just going to go add more square footage on this planet. We're going to open up in the new markets. But they did not have any real change to their business model, which meant they ultimately did not grow their bottom line. In fact, the note says bottom line was on par prior to the recession, but fell by 9% lower than its competitors after the recession. Hmm. So doing any one of these, saying let's be defensive, that can cause you to be too reactive, the least effective model but you still use some of that to, the, uh, to some degree, being promotional. But if you're too aggressive and hyper-focused only on that, you try to jam too much change down the throats of your leadership, mitigating opportunities to best manage that. You, you prevent yourself by, uh, by looking at efficiencies and then saying, okay, what can I do progressively? What, what can we do? What kind of strategic insight can we bring to the table and uh, that's the winner. They have this little, um, little. they put all those four elements down. I, I primarily spoke of three, but they called pragmatic when they're doing combining defense and offense. But all progressive <laughs> was, was the balance of offense and defense. So it's just the better combination of the two. Um, and they have a little image of it. And basically it just says progressive, good combination of these equals winner. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, like Nate, we talked the other day, you were really keen on uh, some competition, meaning as you provide leads on a consistent basis, it's hard to reach executives. Um, that's what you do as, as a business. You're one of the models you communicate in this world is email. You're what you informed me the other day, how the major providers, by the way, is this public information? Have you talked about this in your podcast yeah. yet? No, that's fine though. Go ahead. Yeah. They were talking about how uh, Outlook, my, Microsoft and their 365 programs. Uh, what's the other one? Google? What's Google. the two big ones? Google? Yeah, Google and Microsoft. Yep. They're just saying, hey, we want to make money on ad spends. We don't want to make money on, we don't want you doing these emails for free. None of this, you opt into their website and you get to email them for free forever until they become your client. That mitigates their ability to control. So, as a fan of capitalism, the distinction to what we don't like is when we get into the mono capitalistic, that's where you lose your competitive advantage. There's not a bunch of competitors in a free market. There's no longer free markets because they're dominated, like kind of like television. How many companies own every piece of media to the tune of like 90%? Any of you guys know how many? Because mm -hmm. I don't. It was something like ridiculously small, three, four, five, or something like that. There's some kind of infographic. If you Google it, absolute monopoly. So uh, that's what he was saying is happening in emails. They're trying to crush email deliverability. And the hottest thing I see consistently in my feed is about machine learning, where AI is going, and what can we be doing to find strategic innovation that's just going to help you cut through the clutter and do some really uh compelling things so yeah. you're you're in a an environment to where 
you help cl people get appointments when in the face of adversity called a recession called a what a double digit inflation whatever you want to call this thing um what what are you doing what's 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 one of your forms uh that you're trying to bring to the table that's going to allow you to uh continue to succeed what what are you looking at well, I think there's an interesting combination between strategy and alignment for your target. So uh, first thing I need to do is align to people that are not in retraction, complete retraction mode. You know, so like for us, for ourselves, we're uh, doubling down on the give, by the way. So we're, we're looking for new paths, methods, ways to add in our space executives or the buyer. So how do we add more executive insight, right? Through aha moments, through something they need to have that's gonna give them a competitive advantage um, <clears throat> to open up the relationship first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, stuff you've been talking about for decades, Ted. So, uh, you know, I think we're gonna double down there. Uh, historically, we've gotten most of our meetings from networking and from our own campaigns, right? So like yep. referrals, networks, own campaigns, that makes up all our business. We've, we've dabbled in SEO recently. We've dabbled in a few others, but they're just long, long processes to really win at. So what we're, what we're doing on our end, um, partly because of some of the stuff you shared on, on our last call together, which was, mm -hmm. um, you know, highlighting the investing into assets for us, you know, if, for, if you're in a small business and you're, uh, you know, running a small company, uh, becoming your own publisher is asset development. I know Frank yeah. Kern talks a lot about developing assets 20 yeah. or to 50% of his time. And it's, it's really about developing assets. So what are the assets? So we're writing a book, we're doubling down on content. We're um, trying to become more of the thought leader, do some of the things that we've done in the past. We just stopped doing for the last eight years because we had a pretty robust pipeline, still have a robust pipeline, but it's definitely dwindled. Um, partly what you shared there, Ted, there's, uh, there's a lot of articles um, out in the market, but it is a very silent killer that Google and Microsoft rolled out to the market, which is to kill 99% of spam through AI tech, mm -hmm. right? So like, okay, now think about that. They get to define what spam is. So if you're sending out a marketing message and it's an authentic message. It's called, it's called competitor. <laughs> it's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're not getting seen. We saw in April, and I, I think I shared some of this with you, maybe before, maybe not, but in 15% uh, open rates, the ridiculously lower. low open rates. Yeah. So like even the, the cold marketers that have been used to that, you know, 18 to 25%, sometimes even claiming as high as 40%, like, like us, uh, open rates, all of a sudden between April or the end of May, April, June, um, everything was dropping into single digits for everybody mm -hmm. and yeah. nobody really knew why, you know, we're sending out millions of emails a month. Like, you know, what's they going flipped on? The, they flipped the AI switch. They said, wait a minute. Yep. Right. And that That's happened just at the beginning that. of April and everything got, everything just went disappeared. So nothing's getting through. So you can't get responses if they don't ever see it. Right. So, and it's not like it's going into junk mail. Spam's different. It just disappears. <laughs> Every no business is going to put up with that for long periods of time. I mean, I imagine at some point they're going to just stop offloading email to another service provider, meaning a server in a wall somewhere called Google or Microsoft. They'll just go back old school, old becoming new again, and just put the server inside their own damn building and get past that, won't they? You'd think, but remember the issue is twofold. Yes, it's the outbound part that you're sending from, it gets filtered, but it's also the recipients. So unless there's like, so, so no matter what, you have to deal with it, period. If you want to market- It's kind of like Zoom and Teams. Like you have at to, the end yeah. of the day, when you have a two-way interface, you yeah. got to find something everyone's willing to accept. So yeah. that's why everyone's on this thing with Zoom. And we all know we've read the terms. This is being recorded. We don't own it. Someone else has access to it. Like it's- you know, no one would yeah. want it if we just read the terms. Exactly. But everyone's and on Zoom, so we just do it. So you have to, because you you got to keep growing your business. You got to keep, you know, having commerce move. So what's interesting about the whole thing is that it's not just the attack of AI spam bots, but it's also govern, government, right? Like 
GDPR laws. Cat, so GDPR is the the laws governing email communication in your in the in Europe. CASA laws, the Canadian version. Uh, Poppy laws, the the South African version. You know, there's uh, German law. I don't know what the name of the the exact uh, uh, law is, but it, it like you can't do anything there. You can barely sneeze <laughs> unless yeah. you're communicating. So like California just passed the first version of their Canadian like law, like in that starts January 1st, uh, 2023. So like, what does that mean to marketers? Well, it means every time you send a communication, even to your clients, right? Even to people that you're in, interacting with, you're now at risk of a lawsuit because you're breaking some law that the government has said, hey, we need to put in place. It's a big money grab and it's a way to try to control commerce, but that's not going to stop there, guys. Like that's what we have to understand is that 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 ball is de- over the top of the hill and it's rolling now, right? Like it's so just going to get Well, bigger. you're a subject matter expert to see that that's coming. How are you going to respond for what your clients really care about? Like what what do you think is going to happen to where your clients, do you have enough sensory acuity to know what your client's going to really want and care about? Like, what do they need? What do they want? What's that going to look like? That's going to allow you to make sure you're investing appropriately. Cause you know, you have things you could invest in, right? That's a great, that's a big part of what this data shows is investing yourself is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But if you, and what you missed just before you showed up was there was this piece where it said being preventative, but it talked about if you did that too much, if you focused on that without these other areas, such as operational efficiencies, what yeah. happened is you got too reactive and you're just, you know, you, you mitigate the loss of improve, uh, uh, improvement of your efficiencies mm-hmm. um, because you're doubling down on that focus of change and they end up, they were the worst out of all the companies coming out of the recession. So uh, there's this fun, that's interesting balance. Yeah. I don't know if you, uh, if you get bored, you want, might want to read that. It's again, I pre- preface that the past doesn't dictate the future, but sure does leave some really good clues. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, hmm. I love it. It's interesting. That I, and and I, I know that we have to be thoughtful to the risks of the moment. Right. And especially like this is, uh, you know, in, in reaction to, um, uh, the recession, but like, you know, there's an onslaught and a, a war on top of that recession right now that's coming that says, hey, we don't want you to communicate, right? Like, yeah. it's literally the technology that's trying to stop you from being able to reach out to the market and communicate freely like we've been able to before. Soon there'll be a toll bridge on that, right? Yeah. And then it's a pay to play game again, you know? So, yeah, there you go. Right back into that, right? Uh, yeah. Well, that gets into a lot of political arenas. We won't bother going there because everyone um, may have their own different perspectives on it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I seem to be the odd man out in most of those conversations. I feel very lonely <laughs> with my perspective when I start live, sharing them. That's because you live in Portland, buddy. Uh, well, that you, is that what it is? No, I'd say across the nation. You know, it's it's uh, we're the we're the lonely crowd. We haven't had a president 111 years in the way I voted in the last two presidential elections. Now. Um, when you've got that on the, huh? Because this is what I'm I'm thinking heavily about, is is what can each of our clients do best? And what I know, based on all data, is that statistically everyone waits too long. Everyone just waits too long until, yeah, you know, shit. It's the fan for them to wake up and go, okay, it's time for something to change. Mm-hmm. And they and they have a tendency to wait to be strategic to start investing um, unless you get in close, unless you become a client, then they see it. We've got a, we got a firm. They are in the ag and ag is under attack. Like your space is underneath the attack. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've seen it, but certain nations have just sent out to their major farmers in their entire nation to shut down production because it wasn't good for the environment. So, um, and that's happening now. That's not like a conspiracy theory. That's just, you uh, know, um, but you know, the Euro market is being, um, they, what's that initiative? What's the 2050 initiative? Someone help me in my ignorance there. Uh, what's the 2050 initiative called Someone for, for the climate? Yeah. Yeah. The, um, net zero 2050, some kind of initiative. 
Um, I forgot what it is. It, it's a thing and okay. they're, they're pushing it pretty hard. So they're in that space. So I've got two clients that live very uh, close to each other uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. One is growing organic fruits and vegetables. Another guy is um, innovating this typical tractor. Everyone's got a typical tractor. When, when this guy's grow, uh, harvesting wheat, everyone uses the same stuff harvesting wheat but he found ways to make them become that much more efficient. He found mm. a way to mitigate mold inside the, the harvested product. He found a way. So he just found these little innovations along the way. And that's what he does. So his clients are actually his direct competitors. Like his big, a big 800 pound gorillas would be, I mentioned John Deere, but there are many others that are in that space. Cat, I can go on um, that are in that environment, but they'll sell to them as well. And uh, we were talking about, hey, what what are you going to do in the midst of this? You know, and because they're clients, they're looking at, okay, this is the time to invest in what we're doing now. Let's get a, let's get strategically and move ahead. What can we do? And so I haven't said their name, right? So I can probably say this safely. Um, they said, okay, one of the biggest problems we've had is manpower. Humans have caused us the biggest headaches because of this region, the desire to work and the nation as a whole saying blue collar workers are schmoes, even though it's some of the greatest money you can make as a welder, they want to go put them in debt right away and put them into college instead of go welding and make truckload of money. So they just physically can't get welders, just can't. So they're like, fine. And we started talking because our client life cycle lasts a lot longer earlier in the season. We're like, well, you can mitigate that with, um, you know, robots. And now they literally are installing it. They already went like it, it moved fast. They're like, fine, let's do it. Let's get a robot in there. So now the robot can weld and not a human, right? It's just like, okay, if that's what you need to do for efficiency, you know, Elon Musk 101, right? Just how do you do that with a, a freakishly lot less expensive methodology? In that case, it became a robot. I would have loved to have been a human being. I would have loved for that, but you know, I'm not here to not do anything but what's in their best interest. And so that's their form of in, uh, investing that they never had before. And that's not a small investment to make. But when you're seeing tough times, this is where you can take market share from clients um, like candy from a baby. I always say when you're racing, you pass one car at a time, except when it's raining, except when times are tough. Can you make big strategic moves and leapfrog multiple people at once? So the time to fix the roof was when the sun is shining. But you know what? The sun was shining for so long, people got apathetic. That's the mm -hmm. way of the world. And now it's 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 pretty clear. I gave data just before you showed up that 69% of Americans in that survey uh, believe that they'll be in a recession by the end of 2023. Mm. But then I go, okay, if that's what you know, then what action have you taken today? And that often turns into deaf ears. What are you doing to mitigate the USD? You, you broke up. Repeat that again. Yeah, there's a lot of pause. There's a lot of frozen budgets. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. I heard for only frozen budget. Yeah, so like right, I'm seeing a lot in the in the enterprise space, a lot of frozen budgets. Let's see what happens in a Q1 and a Q2. Oh. Like there's there's freezes on marketing, on sales spend, and like the things that will give the competitive advantage gain market share, the double downs and the opportunities to pass up. I have two clients in the same space. I won't name their names there, but mm -hmm. they're the bigs in the financial services space. Mm -hmm. One of them just doubled down on go, go, go. The other one's executive team said, pull back, stop, freeze. I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. One's significantly larger than the other. And the one that's significantly larger is investing more into marketing and sales the one that's uh, considered more conservative, but low to no growth year over year is uh, the one that pulled back. So it's like indicative of the psychology and the mindset of the leadership yeah. team. Um, it's, it's, it's something to, to be aware of. But well, that's I mean, I that's kind of what, why I'm tipping my head to this Harvard research review is it, it you know, looking at this, it basically talks about these two patterns. 
and the appropriate balance of those patterns. But one thing that they made very clear is like being too late to do such a thing. Like that's the biggest conundrum, too late to uh, operational efficiency, too late to cut, too late to uh, start, you know, looking, racing towards innovation, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, you know, the advice I have now is like, you know, strategize strong, take this time for yourself through these holidays to be more intentional. If your goals were weak, go back at them. If your KPIs don't exist, time to go do the good work. You haven't, you know, yeah. you need a little EOS in your life because you have enough systems. Go read traction for God's sakes. You know, you need to get better at marketing. Go buy the ultimate sales machine. You need to be more effective at selling virtually because a round of masks might come your way again. Well, then get my book, email me, and I'll hook you up with the heart of selling. You know, just get your hands on it. Like, just take time now to do this because the strategist will eat the tactician for lunch every day of the week. Mm hmm you know, that's, you know, the, uh, that was a, uh, on my, uh, le late partner, Chet Holmes and his deathbed, that was the last piece of material that I ever wrote was the death of a salesman, the birth of a strategist mm. was like to, you know, stop being so short sighted, stop thinking like, what's the, the trite thing we've said for 20 years about sales is like, what do you want to have happen from a sales call? Everyone says they want to make a sale, but is that all? No. Well, yeah, no, I want to, you know, I want to have great rapport with them. Okay. That that's a good start. What else? Well, I, <laughs> you know, it'd be great if they can refer me more clients. Fantastic. What else? I'd love it if they see me an expert in my space. Great. What else? Like go look at every tactic. Mm. You're going to do the tactic anyhow, but a strategist will take the time and say, how can I, how many strategic objectives can I tie to that same tactic? If I'm going to send a text or an email or make a phone call, why don't I accomplish 14 different things instead of just one thing. Mm. And that's the, you know, the one thing that you could say, but doesn't mean anyone wants to hear it. It's like, you know, was Thanksgiving not enough for you to finally get your flu and get sick? Don't worry. You got Christmas, New Year's holidays coming right around the corner. You too can go back to your old bad habits and get sick again and say it's some flu invasion from another nation and act like you haven't lived through this 40, 50, 60, 70 <laughs> times in your life. <laughs> right all you got the internet shows you the dates that everyone says everyone got the big flu like by the way isn't that interesting the flu has come back i have not heard that word in years i know COVID that was gone. that was amazing the flu came back by the way if you did not know i heard about that <laughs> after thanksgiving they said the flu's up so hey, Nate. If, is it a coincidence Ted's doing this talk on the 81st anniversary of Pearl Harbor? I'm not saying anything. <laughs> I mean, hey, yeah, you, you're you're saying, do you know what's coming? Do you see it coming? Oh, what are you doing about it? It's like, it. I think people do know. I, I don't think they're completely uh, ignorant of it. I've I've been thinking about this a lot and I was trying to explain it intelligently to my wife on a dinner date. And I realized it was the last, it was the last thing I should have been telling her on a date night. So I stopped talking, but I think there are two things that are affecting humans right now, not just business owners, but across the globe. One is dehumanization. I wrote about this on my plane flight coming back from a big tour speaking everywhere. I, I spoke at one of the last major events before everyone did the shutdown, like capitalism literally was shut down. They said, sorry, none of that. We're, we're not letting you to do that. So they responded in that way. And um, hmm. on that plane flight, I just dove deep. Um, it was specifically about genocide and spinning off of my work that I do and, and my efforts towards mitigating sex slavery. And what I started uh, studying, which I can tell you who I think is the leading expert around uh, the research of genocide on this planet, the very first step in that process is dehumanization. And so um, it was the thing I thought a lot about. And I'm like, okay, we have clearly gotten to that place to where people openly not just in social media where it became socially accepted to just like throw a rock in a glass house and do it freely and openly every day. Everyone knows the shit show Twitter was. So no one just went there. 
that make sense? Yep. Or, or, the, or you did go there, but you just knew you would get the shit show there. Mm-hmm. Well, that went all the way up to our presidents of our nation. Like not even speaking humanely to each other. So when it's infested people from the top down, there was the old 1984 interview of the Soviet, um, not Soviet. He was uh, part of the, um, um, it's like the CIA of uh, the old uh, Russia, KGB. That old interview, I don't know if you guys all saw it. I thought the world saw it. In 1984, he did this interview talking about, here's how we're going to take down the United States. And they break it down. And one of those steps is dehumanization. So I think that's occurred. Like just the people's lack of virtues allow themselves to do polarization and get Mm. manipulated like a little, you know, doll on a string towards if you're not like me, then you're against me. So, and they use language at dehumanizing. So black, white, left, right, right, wrong, male, female, it doesn't matter. It just... And so the bat and in that interview, if you guys ever uh, choose to look it up on YouTube, one of the most scariest piece of data that this guy said was, he goes, you know, what's amazing was we're all impressed. And he mentioned the high counselor of the malicious KGB that wanted to spread communism across the nation. He goes, we're thoroughly impressed how fast Americans adopted because Americans who were doing it to other Americans. They were just like, and we didn't see that coming. We didn't see how good and efficient you would be at like just destroying yourself. So dehumanization, one. But second is the, um, I don't know why it gets challenged so much. It's uh, Don Kruger, Kruger. I'm going to have to go to the internet. Any of you guys uh, got uh, uh, degrees in sociology, psychology, or anything like that? What's the, what's the old effect that says if you're stupid, You're absolutely certain in your stupidity. You're like, I'm absolutely right because they know so little, they're certain of it. Yeah. But intelligent people, the more that we learn, the more we can see all the ways we could be wrong. So therefore, we spend a lot of our time doubting ourselves, going, could could this be wrong? Yeah. And so the it it, what's ironic is the people that are absolutely certain. They're, they just may be stupid or, or even worse, an expert. An expert is like a subject matter expert in one thing, which means I know a lot about one thing and ignorant of most everything else. Right. So if you ever yeah. want to make, yeah. Uh, there was a guy named Chuck Missler. He died a few years ago and he always maintained, he said, the number one impediment to learning anything is the presumption you already have the answer. Yeah. That. And that's really, you know, I have the answer and I won't hear any other options. That that there's an effect, whatever. Kruger, Dunning, Dunner, Kruger. It sounds like name of two people is probably a hyphenate called effect. And that's what they're saying. It's uh, um, that most human beings build their belief structure based on their identity and who they associate themselves as. And so when you're ignorant, which not does not mean stupid, it just means lack of knowledge of a certain subject. You'll just take the group thinks decision, right? And then so you, you, and you're certain with it. But the reason I mentioned that to my wife last night was I wanted to make clear that just because someone has that bias, if you communicate to them with facts, if you bring reason to the table, they still will not change their cognitive bias. They're just going to double down on that. Isn't that interesting? Mm. So as a man who sees himself as a leader, I find myself expressing patience more often and leveraging more of stoic, you know, Marcus Aurelius, or I think he's just the most famous stoic out there of just not judging someone because I've done stupid things before, but, Mm. uh, and not saying they're right or wrong, just being absent of placing a judgment that negates getting caught up in a lot of the dramas, but instead choosing to be of servitude, not in the moment, but planting the seed. Because I know that planting of a seed might take a week, a month, a year to germinate, but with these grays growing, and by the way, my hair is no longer receding, it's coming back. That I did that thing with Tony Robbins I told you guys about. It's I got all these little stubblies all over the place here. I can show you up really close before we shut off. Like I got all these new hairs. So my hair is growing forward, but it's going gray. 
as they become more gray, I'm just learning like how many people come to me and say, wow, you changed my life. But it was something that started 10 years ago. It, it just some people, it, it's going to take what it's, and, and most, I don't think it takes like in winter economic season, you give good advice. They don't do it. Right. If someone's already heavy, as soon as I realized, you know, my family's mostly obese and, you know, I had that stint with that and I found a way to come out of that. You know, no one want to hear anything I had to do because they just know I went to a Tony Robbins event. He's my new partner. I came home all fired up, pumped up. I wanted to tell everyone how they can transform their life and get over their diabetes too. No one heard a thing I had to offer, right? So now it's just a little bit more of an elegant approach minus the judgment <laughs> and not screaming, you're going to die. You know, you're going to be like my dad. He didn't make it 50. You know, that didn't work. Just plant little seeds out of, with compassion and love. <clears throat> it's on, and, 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 and I'm not getting karmically bound in that. They're on their own journey. And it might take a decade for that to change. It might take so, a whole, uh, uh, I don't know how many, how long was, uh, how long did he have to go into the desert, walk with his people so they can get over uh, seeing themselves as victims uh, from being slaves? How long did he have to march them through the? 40 years. 40 years. So back then, 40 years was longer than it is now. That was multiple generations. That was two generations of men. They did not live like we live now. Mm -hmm. So 40 years doesn't feel like a lot. So but that was like, you, what was that? Question for you. I see where you're going, and there are a lot of people where you're just pushing a rope. You're not going to make any headway. Uh -huh. Coming back to a marketing strategy to get the, the pragmatic through the, through the winter season, it seems like part of that is to find that group that is sufficiently like-minded that they keep their businesses going and keep coming to your resource. Oh, you mean, so that sounded like self-serving, like about me and for me? No, um, no. What I'm no, saying what is there, there's a certain population that just, like I said, and, and as fear grows, their mind shrinks, okay? Yeah. And- and what I'm saying is, uh, and Nate, I think you mentioned some of these people are going to complete lockdown and they're locking down their checkbook, which means you're not getting their business right now or not an increase. But there are so those that are self-aware that are doubling down on their investments. Yeah. And, and just like, I mean, I lived through a market in Denver in real estate in, in Colorado years and years ago, where in the 70s, people say, oh, you can't lose and you'll lose any money in Colorado. I've got the receipts that when oil went from forty dollars to eleven dollars, you can certainly lose, can lose money on real estate in Colorado. And and what I'm saying is now, and and what happened though, it became unrealistically pessimistic, to where the fear factor caused an even a greater loss because everybody just was in freakout mode. That's not a but, demographic. That's a psychographic. Now I am being self-serving. I am totally thinking about myself. Because um, that captures a lot of my attention is how do I find those that have already expressed based on their actions, meaning their virtues uh, will dictate their belief structure and the meanings they give to situations, which dictate their actions, which dictate their outcomes. So for me, demographically, I can't put that into LinkedIn and say, hey, no. who's self-aware? or even more esoteric, who's hungry and self-aware? So Because there are people that are self-aware and they're apathetic. They're like, I'm just going to ride this out. I'm going to just retire. Not realizing retirement can be very boring for many. So well, I, I would like to learn how to do that myself because I, I haven't cracked that code right now. Well, and, and one of the questions I would ask though, and let's say Nate for you, uh, and, and the same thing for me. Like I had two calls today where they aren't pulling in their horns. What they're looking to is, hey, how can I improve the efficiency? They have my systems in place. The biggest thing both companies are facing is staffing. And in both cases, they have staff doing the job, but they've, they've so contorted the process that now their employer is being held hostage by the employee. You know, I've got the goods on you. I know how to make this work. I've made it so convoluted. You can't replace me. 
And in both cases, the employers called me today, two different companies, and said, we've had it. This person has reached the point where the price of the egg is not worth the wear and tear on our backside. And this person's going to get replaced. What do we need to do with you to get a staff person or something in place? Because we're just done. We're done being held hostage. You know, kind they're of gonna, like- They're going to continue to be held hostage as long as they try to hold people accountable. Until you start hiring people that are willing to have the virtue of, I am an accountable person, you're always fighting the upstream battle of not having a culture fit. Like if they yeah. truly want people to be accountable, they hire accountable people. They don't hire people and then hold them accountable. See the distinction on that? Yeah. Like if you hire people and then you try to pip them to death to hold their ass accountable, you're cracking the whip nonstop. Instead, you hire accountable people. And then you love them in and love them out if they choose not to act in alignment to what that virtue was. You want to hire and fire based on the culture you want to create regardless of performance. Uh, Tony Shea, uh, Delivering Happiness book. Right? It's mm -hmm. like that. That's. I heard him say that to me year after year and I didn't click until the fourth year. And he said that at our business mastery event. I like, I got it. I'm like, he said, hire and fire based on the culture you want to create regardless of performance. Well, I was ignoring the regardless of performance thing because my top producer making me the most amount of money and there were multiple of them. Uh, they were the ones that were off. Like not so off right out of the gate. You didn't feel it, but man, you go out past a week or a month, but if you go out a year or two years and five, in this case, seven years, I felt like I was on a completely different Island than these people. <laughs> right. It just, Culture, culture, culture. So yeah, I if they let them go, that's great. But boy, I wonder. I wonder if they're going to turn around, just be victimized again, if they see themselves as victims because they chose to hire people that they had to hold accountable versus allowing themselves to, they, they, they got to start with themselves to step up to foster an environment. They are the keepers of their environment. They have the, the business is an ecology and it's got a diversity of things. And, and you don't call all bacteria bad. I mean, you guys know that half of your body is bacteria not and blood cells, right? Like you have as much bacteria in you as you do blood cells. It's important to have. That's why when our kids were young, you know, I don't know how you guys were, but I was the classic daddy. Like, it's totally cool that the kids are putting dirt in their mouth. You guys remember that age? There were toddlers, they were still in diapers, and they'd grab the dirt and they'd just jam it in their mouth. I never understood why they're doing it. They're actually feeding their ecology. They need diversity, right? <laughs> but now we run around like, oh my God, dirt on the hands, sterilize it, rip off their, you know. Well, they don't have an immune system. <laughs> but I mean, my point is like, you know, there's that's what we are. And, and it's an ecology. So, You've got to be a good foster. You got to foster that ecology as a leader and accountability isn't something you do. It's something that you are. So think of it, be, do, have. Okay. I've got a question for you. Going back to something Nate said, if he's getting blocked out of the game on the email marketing, what would he have to do? Let's say I'm one of his clients. And he says, you know, if I'm getting blocked out of the next guy, maybe Rod can take me to a bunch of the other next guys. And then how does he build a strategy where he makes it easy for me to help him? You know, it's one of the things I've always told people, help me help you and you'll think I'm pretty good at this. Yeah. So I guess, Nate, that'd be a question to think through is that I'm not getting blocked because I'm me just sending the guy an email. I'm That's not right. using merchant. So there's a chance... You know, if I like you, you like your product. And if you make it easy for me to help you, then you know what? I don't have a problem with that. And and I guess maybe that's part of what happens because from what you're telling me, not only they're blocking you, but the likes of California. Well, they're not blocking him because he's got strategic. He does yeah. something very unique. I know just because I'm his client, but uh, you said make it easy. And that, that intrigues the hell out of me. What Roger said, make it easy. So how, what does your clients perceive as easy? Cause I wonder if you think easy is based on what you perceive as easy, Nate, but what do your clients consider easy? What makes it easy just so you can help them get reclaim their 40% deliverability rates instead mm -hmm. of their mismal, you know, 10, 15. 
you know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. There's always the blend between what somebody wants and what they need. Right. And so I can give them what they want, which is a month to month contract, low commitment, all performance based initiative, but they won't respect it. They won't honor the leads, the meetings, they'll dog those meetings. So they don't value them. Then they'll say they're bad and then they'll fire us. <laughs> so it's like, so, but if they respect those meetings, they respect the leads and they inspect and they respect the investment they've made. Cause for me, a lot of our clients are executives, you know, their most valuable assets, their time. And the way that they value that time is by putting money towards it. And otherwise they, it's easy for them to push off and they often will. So like, I'll give you a perfect example. We had a client in New York and their average deal size was like 35 million. They were a licensing agency for Madonna, for Shaq, for like, they, these guys made Mad Bank. I was like, oh, this is beautiful. He'll give me, a, he's going to give me a 7% commission on anything they close. All I got to do is bring Shaq's brand to the manufacturing market or this to that market or whatever it might be. And we crushed it. I mean, we gave them so many meetings. And there are great opportunities. And guess how many calls they actually showed up to? Like, you mean your client didn't show up or the actual person you prospected didn't show up? No, my client wouldn't show up to the meetings because it wasn't valuable to them. It was all performance. They, they oh, I had something else come up or a client call came up or this, yeah. whatever. So I chose not to show up for Shaquille O'Neal. Sorry. Yeah. You know, no, 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 no. Like they, they repped Shaquille to like a manufacturer. So a manufacturer exec or a CEO from a manufacturing plant that's, uh, you know, or let's call it an apparel company that wants to mm -hmm. put Shaq on a big sweater with this big mug, you know, for lack of a better example. Um, we would bring that manufacturer company that wants to come license that image and likeness, give him a royalty, them a royalty, and make these t-shirts with Shaq's brand on it, right? Like, that's what it was. So we'd bring shoe companies, all these apparel companies, toy companies, whatever, you name it, to the door great opportunities, but for the, our client, the, the, the licensing agency, and they just showed up when they wanted to, you know, because there was no investment. It was just all just performance based, which hmm. we could crush. And so it was really interesting to me, you know, it was a big lesson for us. Not that it's not, it, look, it, some, I'm sure there's like out of 10 that two of those are going to work really well, or three of them are going to work really well. Maybe that would have been worth it. But the point is that we've, we've tried a lot of different models and ultimately you have to be accountable to the things you control. They have to be accountable to the things they control. And um, like, you know, I have some really good relationships and some of my clients close 30% of everything they do. And we've moved to a performance-based relationship over time and that's fine, but they've proven their side, right? And we've proven our side and everybody can honor that, you know, but not everybody is able to get there. I think this is gonna be a good conversation for the entire business breakthrough community to spend an entire session on, which is how do we balance the distinction between what someone wants and what they need? Mm. I think that's the most universal dance in business is people want one thing, but they really need another. And we've got to find some kind of shiny way to say, you want this and then hook them for that. What target do? Oh, you want chic, cheap, chic? Hey, we got all these designers. They hook them what they want, which is sheep cheek, and then get them at $1.8 billion because they went and bought food that day at Target. Right. <laughs> I think that'll be a whole conversation, which is how do we strategically innovate in our business model that uh, has a good balance between what they want and what they need? Yeah. 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 That's what I love want. it. I had, um, Hey, Rod, I'll forward you this, uh, this data I just forwarded or that I spoke to today I cited. I'll just send it your way right now so you have it in your inbox. If it's something you uh, get bored one day and you want to give it a little read, quick, easy read. I obviously liked it myself. That's so, hey, well, hey, could you do one more thing for me? Yeah, what's that? Give me a little outline of what Nate does. From Nate, your perspective. stadium pitch. I can give him my, <laughs> I can give him my perspective if you want. You want mine or you want Nate's? Well, you know, I don't want to put him on the spot. Well, he, he, he oh, should be yeah, pretty good. He should be pretty, pretty good, good at what he does because he was a client at one time. So I You're spent, uh, he's I'm a good curious. protege. You better not suck right now. Otherwise oh, you're going to make me man. look man. You don't have to do anything. I'm putting you on the spot, but I'm saying, if you have something simple for a, yeah. you know, an old guy like me to understand, 
get my email from uh, from Ted and shoot it over to him if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, but let's hear the pitch right now before we let each other go. What's your current stadium pitch, Nate? Um, well, um, we ha- basically our our business is in the business of helping uh, you make better relationships so that you can build your business. And we do that with executives. So we're going to help you generate, you know, 20 to 60 meetings, 20 to 100 meetings a year with senior executives, C-suite executives, and then we guarantee it. It's pretty simple. To get meetings with the most hard to reach individuals on the planet. Yeah. Just do the thing you can never do on your own. Yeah, it's nice. They just do it for you. Yeah, top to bottom. Holy man. Like booked right into your calendar with a nice little PDF that gives you all the data on them. So when you show up to the meeting, it says, you know, here's all their information you want. Here's their links to their LinkedIn profile. Here's how their revenue number, employees, how long they've been in business, if they got hobbies listed. Nice little PDF, by the way. That's new. I've not seen that before this year. Yeah, just started. If you had it. Oh, okay. I was going to say, if you had it for years, you never sent it to me. What's up? (laughs) (laughs) I was like, why why didn't I get those before? Always adding value. You like those though, Well, right? yeah, because uh, people move around a lot. Yeah. And sometimes you'll have a city that's different than mine. And time zones is killer for appointments. And I, oh, yeah. you know, inevitably someone's like, I totally screw up in time zone. Where are you at? No, I'm in Florida right now. You know, his yeah. business is listed in central time zone. He lives in Arizona, which is, it depends what time of year, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all kinds of things. Yeah. 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 I look a little bit like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah. There's, well, a, there's, I think also, you know, Ted understanding the, in the, in terms of like the, give them what you want and, and or give them and, and deliver what they need. You know, like one of the things that we've really found over the years is that contracts can really support that the way that you actually contract the relationship can support them in getting them what they need because mm-hmm. like we had we had one client and if i do I have a minute okay ex- two yeah months. of course you have well you actually have uh two minutes and like 30 seconds <laughs> had a client who w- contracted for a little over 100 meetings on the year and it And the way that we contract our work, we do a six month, you can back out, but we're going to waive our guarantees if you don't want to commit to the whole process. So the reason we do it that way is because typically between months five and seven, the bit, everybody would crack their code of the messaging. Right. Mm -hmm. And this guy was at just around 30 meetings at the seventh month coming on the seventh month mark. It's like, I'm going to opt out here. I think I've had enough. I'm not close to my number. I was like, okay, but just remind you, you know, your money's guaranteed at a year, but not at six months. If you back out, then you just threw that away. I was like, what do you want to do? And he's like, oh, well, in that case, I'll just pay the year. And if you need to owe me something, I'll get it back then. And we cracked the code like two weeks later. And the guy got 50 meetings a month for the rest of the year. Ended up at 372 meetings with CEOs and CFOs of 5,000 plus size companies in Europe only. It was like one of the most spectacular blow ups of a campaign. But because of the way we contracted that saved his ass and he got 121 face to face meetings with that market because of the way the contract helped him get him what he needed. Love it. So I love it. Help manage expectations in their own best interest. Because if people knew what their best interest was, they'd already be getting 50 appointments like hand over fist. Right, Nate? So great job. Perfect example. I'm going to tell my, I got a consultant that's uh, working on a deal right now that needed to hear that story. I'm going to send him a little soundbite clips. (laughs) I don't know if you guys caught yourself on social media, but these get chewed up into little clips, busting them out into the, the web. I'm now on Instagram more than I've ever been in my life, which just All means right. I'm only commenting cool. there, but I'm there. Yeah. So uh, I'd say that's probably the best platform for little sound bites of videos. Do it on LinkedIn, do it on Facebook, uh, YouTube channels building out. That takes time. And uh, if you guys have any great experience in YouTube ads, you let me know. What was that? Dad, are you on Twitter? Uh, I don't have them posted on Twitter right now. I didn't know um, what that would look like and how that could uh, best work. I'm there, but I'm not active like I am with these. Uh, um, it's not in the platform, but I can go check it out. I, do they let me do videos yet? Can you do no past idea. 140? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't hey, been I'm out of it for a while. I'm trying to figure out how to get a MySpace account. Come on. A MySpace <laughs> account? Okay. I'll, look, I'll, I'll hang up and I'm going to look into that right now, but. Hey, All right, I appreciate like, jumping your time. Care,
Bye. See you later. Bye, guys. Later, skaters. All right. Bye.